So welcome to ARC again. And this week is an extension of last week. So last week we looked at really biblical foundation for God's command to love ourselves. So remember, it's not, not only does God allow you to love yourself, he actually commands us to. But that has a specific meaning. So we looked at all that last week. What we didn't really get to focus on too much last week was the slightly more complex task of loving other people, and particularly those who are not especially lovable. So if you if you live in the same world as me, there's, um, there are a lot of people in the world that are definitely not very lovable. So we are nevertheless commanded to love them. So if you've got one of these, let's just start by seeing what John has to say to set the scene. So this is the stick on your wall or on your fridge or whatever, just so you can memorise this for the week. So 1 John 4 verse 19. We love because he first loved us. And if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not, who, sorry, the, the one who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God who he has not seen. And this command we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. So if we translate that, what's John saying to us? He's saying, you can't tell me that you love God. You can say to me all day long that I love God. Who you've never seen face to face, right? Have any of you seen God face to face? You know, has he come round to your place for dinner? He, John is saying to us, don't tell me that you love God, who you've never seen, if you don't love your neighbour who's right there in front of you, who you have seen. Can anyone suggest, if you were trying to explain this to a completely unchurched, unsaved person, what's John trying to spare us from? What's he telling us not to be? Take the example of someone who's very noisy about their love for God, but plainly doesn't love other people. What would we call them? A hypocrite, right? So this is a warning against hypocrisy. So, love for other people, can anyone suggest, it's a command, right, but can anyone suggest in a practical sense, what does it represent in a believer's life when other people see, are able to see without any trouble, that you love those around you, and as we'll see in a minute, not limited to those who love you back. What, do you, what purpose do you think that serves in God's economy? Why does he want people to see that his people love others, even those who don't love them back? What's God's purpose in that? So to help you out, I'll ask you a question. Do you think it's normal to love people that don't love you back? And do you think it's normal to love people who hate you? No. So God is asking us to do something to be seen by others that's very not normal <coughs> for humans. Got a clue now? He wants the evidence that God himself is real, the evidence that Christianity actually creates a real change. He wants the unsaved to see that there's something profoundly different about his people. So if we don't love the people around us, that's entirely missing from our, our life. is not impacting anyone, is it? So with that in mind, so that's why I printed this separate, so you can put that somewhere for the week as your bookmark or on your fridge or whatever, and really just be good to just memorize that, just for your own sake, to remind you why would it become more important towards the end? When everything in the world gets worse and worse and worse and 
Satan's people start to really get bold, why would this become more important, not less important? The answer is, the worse the world gets, the more important it is that we are seen to be separate. It becomes more important to God that it's obvious to people that we are different, that we walk a different direction, that we represent something unusual. Otherwise, we're not really witnesses, are we? We're just camouflaged, we're just lost in the crowd if we are no different than the world. So the worse it gets in the world, the more important this is, actually. So to give you an example, our lesson's quite short to, tonight, and, um, and there is Zumba class after, for those who are ready and those who are not as well. <laughs> but on the front page, this cover, this is just a cover, but I want to talk about this person whose picture you can see at the top. Let's see what it says here. Her name's Corey Ten Boom. Unusual name, and she's Dutch. She's passed away now, but when I was young, she was super famous. And see, this is a quote from her. He said, uh, so, sorry, she says, when he tells us to love our enemies, he gives along with the command, the love itself. So he doesn't ask us to do something out of ourselves. Because remember what we just said, it's not a human, it's not a human quality to love strangers. And it's even less of a human quality to love our enemies, right? So he gives us a command, but as Corey says here, with it, he gives us the power to carry that command out. He gives us the power to do something as a lifestyle that the unsaved world can't. Now, why, who's heard of Corey Ten Boom before? So, I want to tell you about her because she is like the ambassador of this subject. Corey, all until she died at the age of 80, 85 years in 1980 something, or 90 something, she was an evangelist all over the world and her core message was, you must forgive. God commands us to forgive and to love our enemies. Her message over and over, she went all over the world saying, you must forgive. If you do not forgive, God will not forgive you. And, and forgiving them isn't enough, she said. You have to go past forgiving them. You have to actively love them. So it would be easy to say, if you've been hurt by wicked people, if you are injured, scarred even, it'd be easy for you think, to say that, oh, well, that's all right for you. You haven't experienced what I've experienced, right? So if you look at the picture, I'm sorry on the camera you won't be able to see this, but if you look at this picture at the bottom, I don't know how well you can see that, but you see all these women there in the cold with hardly any warm clothes and behind barbed wire. This picture is taken during World War II at Ravensbrück concentration camp for women. So all of the prisoners at Ravensbrück were female. 50,000 women died in that camp. Right next door was a second Ravensbrück number two camp was for girls who were 16 to 21 years old. Only 500 girls survived from that camp. This was one of the most murderous camps. It's extremely, do you say famous? Infamous, right? An absolutely terrible, terrible place. Corey and her family were Christians in Holland, they're Dutch. And when the Germans invaded Holland and captured Holland, behind the German army came the German secret police, the Gestapo, looking to round up the Jews and send the Jews to the death camps. It's not 
a lot of people don't know that in Europe there was a massive resistance against the Germans, a secret, like a secret army. And lots of those resistance people were born again Christians. And, what, and in the early days, one of the main things they did is they hid Jewish families at personal risk to themselves, because if you were found hiding a Jewish family, they, they could just shoot you on the spot. Or as happened to the Ten Boon family, they, the Ten Boon family rescued dozens and dozens of Jewish families. There was like a whole smuggling route to Switzerland and, uh, or across the channel to England, and they would hide them from the Germans, and then they would smuggle them out of Holland to safety. But someone ratted on them, and the Gestapo came to the Ten Boom house and arrested everybody. Her, the whole family was locked up. Within a, a very short time, her brother died in prison in suspicious circumstances. They're not Jewish, right? They're Christians. Eventually, the rest of the family were released, but Corey and her sister Betsy were sent to Ravensbrück concentration camp, this place, where they received the same appalling treatment as everybody else. To give you some idea of how bad this place was, if you were there, you were used as slave labour but hardly fed. So they would literally work you to death, mostly for the Siemens uh, Electrical Company, who still exists today, a very big, powerful German electronics company, Siemens. Well, they use slave labour, mostly these women, right? If you did the tiniest thing wrong, the guards had authority to do whatever they liked to you. And the guards at Ravensbrück, the all-female guards, mostly female guards, were uh, after the war, when they had the war crimes, tri the trials, some of the worst Nazis put on trial were the female guards from here, including, do you know that actress Marilyn Monroe? Mm. You know what she looks like? So imagine Marilyn Monroe in a German army uniform, and you're looking at Irma Grieser, Irma Grisa was just 23 years old. Her favourite thing was to set her Alsatian dogs, her German Shepherd dogs. She would set them on female prisoners at random and they, the dogs would tear them to pieces, kill them, while she just laughed. Absolute psychopath of a woman. And she was typical of the guards there. This is where Corey, who's just in her 20s, right, so imagine you've tried to serve God, you've tried to protect these Jewish people, and your reward is you're in this place. No special treatment. Someone like Irma Grisa can kill you like that if she feels like it. What do you think Corey and her sister Betsy did? Any idea? Take a guess. I'll give you a clue. She's a hero of mine. So that'll give you a clue that she didn't do nothing. What do you think she did? She had, a, she had someone smuggle a Bible. Really risky. She had someone smuggle a Bible into the concentration camp. And then under the noses of the guards, she started evangelizing the prisoners. And she used to run church in the, in the concentration camp without the guards knowing. And hundreds of prisoners got saved in Ravensbrück concentration camp, going to secret church with Corey and her sister. So God, her love for God, and her understanding of what we just read from John, never faltered, even though she's in this terrible place, being abused all the time. Her sister Betsy was abused even more. In the end, Betsy died. So she lost her brother, and now she lost her sister, died in front of her in the camp. Did it deter her from running church, from evangelizing Jewish girls, whoever was there? It wasn't all Jewish prisoners in Ravensbrück, it's all kinds. 
And here's the thing. Eventually, Ravensbrück was liberated when the Germans lost the war. The Allies turned up and liberated the camp, and Corey was out, still alive. In terrible state, but she's still alive. So she's seen the worst atrocities you can imagine. They conducted medical experiments on prisoners that usually killed them, all sorts of stuff, right? So the worst you can think of, this woman, just a girl really at the time, she saw it all. Do you think she would be angry with those Germans? Do you think she'd want revenge? You know what she did? When she got back to Holland, she found that there were all these Dutch people who had cooperated with the Germans. And now the Dutch people hated them and would want to like string them up. Because they, Corey, who no one could argue with because she was a concentration camp survivor, Corey opened a hostel for those people. She took them all in. So she fed them and clothed them and found work for them and rehabilitated them. Because as far as she was concerned, the fact that they had cooperated with the same people that murdered her sister didn't make any difference to God's command. Love your enemies. In the end, she was called as a witness to, in the war crimes and she very publicly, she made sure it was public in the press, she went and she found the guards that used to guard her at Ravensbrook and she publicly forgave them, for real. Gave them the gospel, did everything she could to save them. These are the people that had killed her sister. Is that what we read suddenly? have a different weight all of a sudden when you realize if anyone had an excuse to be bitter, if anyone had an excuse to be angry, if anyone had an excuse to look for revenge, isn't it someone like this? Instead, she's out there and she spent the rest of her life, like I say, she passed away at 85 years of age, still actively evangelizing. She spent the rest of her life preaching that message. You must forgive. You must bless those that hate you. You must seek the salvation of those that persecute you. You must love your enemy as God loves you. It's easy to say those things, right? But imagine putting yourself in her shoes. Can you imagine doing it? Because we are all commanded to do it. Not easy for the human nature, right? Hence her saying, God gives us the command, but he gives us the love with which to do, to, with which to carry the command out as well. So she's my example, like to see that in action. You can read a bit more, you can look her up. She has a very famous book called The Hiding Place, which gives her a whole story. Very good reading if you're looking for something to read. So now, let's look into the practicalities of these things. Since it is a command for us to do it, let's look. <coughs> so last week, we remember we looked that there's a, a definite order of progression in how God wants us to reach this ability to be able to love our enemies, to love our neighbor. And it's an order of priority, an order of uh, like steps, right? So you remember the first one? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and strength. So the word there is agape specifically. So we know agape love is that is described as the love that causes you to want to obey God, to be Christ-like. So it's not filio friendship and it's not eros sexual attraction. It's agape specifically. All your heart, remember, is, remember this is Greek, so it doesn't mean that organ that beats away in your chest. It means with, with your whole innermost being, who you really are inside. How much of it? With all your heart, with your whole self, love God. With your whole mind. Can anyone throw up an idea why it was 
God draw a distinction? Your whole heart, your whole innermost being, why does he then add on top of that your whole mind? What do you normally associate with your mind? What do you use your mind for? Thoughts. Thoughts. And what's thoughts about? Are thoughts about feelings? What are thoughts about? Rational things. Rational arguments. God says, come, let us reason together. God is a rational being. God is not some wavy, fluffy marshmallow in the sky. He is hes like the ultimate supercomputer rational. You know? And as you... And as you know, the more you study scripture, the more you understand that the whole thing is very rationally laid out. God does not ask you to have a blind faith about anything. He sets the whole argument out rationally for us. So with our mind, he wants us to engage with our mind. And what was, remember from last week, what was the key element in love that without it, you can't have love? It's one thing, starts with T, truth. Without truth, you have nothing. If, if you're not always religiously about truth, your love will be fake. Truth has to do with rational thinking, right? Truth isn't about, it's not a true feeling, it's a true thought. Truth is one and one always equals two. Truth like that. So that's why we have to engage with God with our mind rationally because truth is so vital to love being real and the last strength with all your heart your mind and your strength what do we associate strength with you can cheat and just read it if you like with action so as James says, faith without deeds is dead. You can, you can rationally understand love. You can desire it with all your innermost being. But if you never get up and do anything, are you someone who loves? No. You're just someone who thinks about it, <clears throat> feels about it, but never does it. You know, you're like that person that's in their bedroom that got 2,000 travel brochures from every travel agent in the country and has never left home. You know, you're an expert on where you've never been. <laughs> you know, but you're convinced that it'd be a good idea to go there. What's wrong with you? Get up and leave the house, right? It's the same thing. This classroom where he teaches us what this agape is requires that threefold engagement. The whole of you with your whole mind and that should turn into action. Otherwise, if it doesn't turn into action, like say you're like that person who has all the travel brochures but never leaves the house, right? Not good. Then the second and third stages, Jesus calls it the, the second law, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. But remember we looked at, that's really two things. But they're so closely related, we call it one law. It has two parts to it. Love your neighbour and love yourself. And as we read in Luke 45, uh, Luke 6, 45, out of the heart the mouth speaks. Eventually, you can keep up appearances right, but sooner or later, who you really are inside, who you are at, at heart, inwardly, that will always show up. And, and if I'm your friend, if I'm engaging with you, sooner or later, who you really are is how I will be treated. You might, you know, if I'm a visitor to your church and you're on greeting at the door today, no doubt you'll be sickeningly nice and annoyingly friendly, you know, and irritatingly eager to talk to me. And I'll think, wow, you're a nice person. But if you're not really a nice person inside, if I hang around you 
for some weeks or months. Eventually, my experience of you will be not that thing that you could keep up for one day. My experience of you will be who you are really inside. That's what out of the heart the mouth speaks really is talking about, that who you are inwardly eventually shows up. You know, so in terms of loving my neighbour, my neighbour's experience is driven by who I really am inside. That's what my neighbour will experience in the long run. Hence that second command really is two quite important distinct things that to love, before I love my neighbour, I need to love myself so that the person that loves my neighbour benefits my neighbour. If I'm still just worldly inside, my neighbour's not going to gain anything useful by me being around, are they? That they, couldn't, that they couldn't gain from any unsaved person. So if you remember back to last week, the priority of loving God first is so that I can learn to agree with him about me in truth and action. So what's the first truth I need to agree with God about myself? Is there any valid, is there any rational reason why God should love me truly? <clears throat> no. All have sinned, all have fallen short, I'm a lawbreaker, I'm a disappointment, and sometimes I'm worse than a disappointment. Right? So what did we learn last week? Did, therefore did God say, well I'm not going to love that guy, look at that guy. What did we read? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God did not wait for us to be perfect before loving us. So that's the first truth about his love for me that I have to apply in my love for me. I have to agree with him. But humans don't do that. We bang on ourselves constantly. We postpone agreeing to love ourselves until we think we've reached some <coughs> special level, but we never really know what that is. So it never really happens. Most people are never good enough for themselves. That's why people keep wearing a mask. That's why people work so hard on you not discovering who they really are inside. Because they're terrified that if you discovered who they really are inside, that you wouldn't like them. Because they don't like themselves. So the very first truth we have to embrace is that I'm not worthy in any legal sense of being loved. But since God ignored that and loved me when I was at my worst, I don't have a right to postpone loving me. But I have to stay in the truth. The truth is, who I am is still no good. So my love has to start loving me to change. He, his love wants me to change my love for myself needs to have the same agenda. How do I do that? Well, I set out to put my love into action. I start to obey his commands, and doing that, that activity progressively changes me. The more I agree with the, the, all the aspects of his love for me, the more I agree with him about myself and start treating myself in agreement with him, not that unreal, untrue, or oh, I just accept me as I am. Does God accept you as you are? No. That's a total lie. I hear churches preaching that all the time. God doesn't accept you as you are. God invites you in spite of who you are. But he requires you to change. So we shouldn't be just accepting in the way that you sit back in your Christian deck chair thinking that, oh well I'm a Christian now so I'm good, I'll just wait to go to heaven. No? See what I mean by love has to deal in the truth? So you're not allowed to condemn yourself, you're not allowed to bag yourself, you're not allowed to postpone loving you, but your love for you has to be the same as his. 
Your love for you has to desire better for you. Your love for you has to constantly promote change towards Christ-likeness. And how quickly can you do that change? Not very. So is God patient with us? Yeah? So his love is patient. You know, 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not store up a record of wrongs. Right? So how should I love myself? With patience. I need a lot of patience with myself because I am a very poor student in this department. You know? You have to be kind, not harsh, on yourself. And you mustn't keep a record of your failures. If you sin as a Christian, what are you supposed to do? Comes from John. If we confess our sin, what happens? He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. He makes us clean of it, right? So we used to have a saying, counselling, that if you've dealt with something with God and he has forgiven you, which he promises to do, then that thing has to be thrown in the lake that has the big sign sticking up out of the lake, no fishing. <laughs> you know, you must not store up a record that slowly sits there accusing you as if God had not forgiven you, as if you had not moved on and changed. Remember? Because he loved you when you were at your worst, you are no longer that person. You're not yet who you will be, you're no, not yet perfect, but you're already not that person you were at the beginning, and he loved you then. You have to have that same view. You have to be in agreement with him or yourself in order to be perfectly keeping this command. Right? One measure, remember? If I'm going to love my neighbour, anyone then care to take... a a while to guess what my love for my neighbour should look like. When should I start loving my annoying neighbour? When they get to how when should I wait for? Well, one standard, right? So no waiting at all. <coughs> Even while they're at their worst, you should love them now. With Patience and some neighbours require an astonishing degree of <laughs> patience. <laughs> but I'm not saying this is easy, and it isn't easy. And some people are nearly unlovable, right? In the human sense. But we'll come to this in a second. But this is about what we do, right? So all I'm wanting you to grasp at this point is that just there's not a whole lot of things to learn, just one thing to learn. What you learn in, about his love for you, that is, that is the toolkit. You apply that one toolkit to yourself and to your neighbour. You, so that's good, right? You only need one set of skills. One truth, multiple applications. So that's good for lazy people like me means I don't have to learn a whole lot of different stuff. I don't have to have 16 different ways of operating, depending on who I'm with, right? No, just one. Just one. I want to just, as we get onto page two, halfway down, go down to the box of Luke 6. So I'll read it first and then I'll explain why I've included it. Luke, so if you're watching from home, turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 6, verse 46. Luke 6, 46. Jesus says to them, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you do not do what I say? Let's just pause there for a second. So he says, Lord, Lord. He doubles it up. So for the sake of those who don't know this from, from the rules of Midrash, in Hebrew, when a Jew 
repeats himself. Lord, Lord. Or if you've got an old King James Bible, sometimes you'll read, Verily, verily, I say to you. What does that mean? Why does it say, why does verily repeat itself? Well, this is the answer. In Midrash, a repeated word is the same as when you're texting and you suddenly switch to typing the whole sentence in capitals. It's shouting. It's meant as a written form. It's meant to indicate that whatever follows it is of extra weight, extra importance. You know, it's like, look, pay attention, right? So when they say, Lord, Lord, what is Jesus saying to the crowd? He's saying to them, you are emphasizing to me that I'm your Lord. You are enthusiastically and zealously calling me Lord. That's what repeating it means. So what can you say about these people? These people think in their minds that they are his subjects. You're our Lord, you're our Lord. So many churches like that, right? They spend the whole service doing nothing but singing those chorus songs. Doing this. Oh, Jesus, you're our Lord, you're great, you're this, you're every other thing. You know, you are our God. Glory to you, praise to you. For the whole church service, right? Big noise, lights and smoke and everything else. But what is Jesus saying to them? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do? What's doing? Action. You have all this noisy talk, but you don't have any action. You don't actually do what I instruct. He says, why do you call me Lord if you don't do what I ask? Remember what we saw back there, that how important, not just with all your heart, not just with all your rational mind, but with all your strength. Understanding the truth is useless if you never put it into action. And this is Jesus speaking. So those churches, lots of those churches are in big trouble. Because what does it say in Matthew will happen on the day when everyone has to give an account? When he says, many will come in that day, what, what's next? Many will come in that day saying, same thing again, Lord, Lord, look at all the things we did in your name, right? What does Jesus tell them he's going to say to them? Go away from me. We don't have a relationship. What's he saying? He's saying this same exact same thing again. There you are, so noisy, so boasting, but you never did anything I said. You didn't keep my commands. You were real busy doing something. You know, you're real busy doing your own will. You're real busy following your own ideas, social work or whatever it was, but you completely ignored my commands. You were never my disciples. I was never actually your Lord. This is a very important lesson as lawlessness starts to take hold in the world, right? We have to remind ourselves, be reminded, that, that to really be sure that we are in the covenant and therefore we can, we can own all the promises of the covenant. You know when Jesus is saying this to us. So now you can understand this in terms of agape, with all your strength. Don't just know what he says about you, about others. Put those things into action. Then you are his disciple. Then all the promises of the covenant are promises to you, and God never breaks a promise to those he promises. Right? You gain your confidence from obeying. Then he emphasizes, so on verse 47, he goes straight on to expand on this to tell you in a practical sense what it means. He says, as for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and then puts them into practice. 
That's the key. They don't just hear, they put them into practice. He says, I will show you what that person is like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid foundation on the rock, on the immovable rock. And when a flood came and the torrent struck that house, the house was not shaken because it was well built. Why was it well built? Because it was built with all your heart and with all your rational mind seeking the truth, the truth to walk in it, to live by it. So when it says dig, why the foundations you had to dig down to solid rock, what does that look like if you go home to do that tonight? You think, oh, I'm going to go and do that tonight. You get home, what does it actually have to do? You're all very good at it now, by the way. What do you think it is? What house is Jesus building? When God had all the professions in the world that he could have his son come as, what did he choose? Carpenter. Carpenter. What do carpenters do? They build things. And specifically, they build houses. Jesus is, comes as a carpenter because he's the builder of God's house. What does God's house look like? Is it made of wood? Is it made of stone? What's it made of? Living stones. It's the body of Christ, right? But it has to have, for that house to stand up and be able to weather the storm, because merely this parable is about us. To weather the storms, what kind of storms are there? Well, the biggest storm that will ever, the typhoon that will come at the end, is the tribulation. Right? So this house to stand in the tribulation, th what he says has to have happened. The builders, those who helped build, had to dig down until they hit solid rock. And the foundation of that house had to be on the solid rock. What is that a picture of in terms of your practical walk? It's a New Testament house being built up what has to be under it for that New Testament house? The Old Testament. The careful builder makes sure that their New Testament beliefs are supported by the solid rock foundation of what the prophets have already said. Remember, the New Testament is, sits on the old like a house on its foundations. If your New Testament understanding is in conflict with the old, as if God had had a personality transplant, as if he said, as if he went to all that effort to speak through his prophets and then threw it all out the window to come up with something else. That's not God at all. Then you're building on sand. You think, who would do that? Well, only most of the church. That's who. <clears throat> so you guys are good at this now. You are. I know that from when you're sharing in your Bible studies and things, right? You're good at it, you get it. So continue in that and encourage others to do the same, that you are ensuring that you, what you're building, each other, when you're building each other up, you are actually helping set a living stone in its proper place in the house. You are assisting the chief carpenter in building the house. But by having, by sharing, sound teaching that you are happy and, cons and content that it sits properly on its Old Testament foundations and you're happy that it's solid, then you're helping that person be built up in a way that's solid that when the storms hit, they won't be blown away. They'll be immovable. And then he contrasts it but the one who hears my words and doesn't put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without any foundation. Well, that's most of the church, right? I, think I said to the men's group the other night that I had lunch with one of our friends that I, for the sake of the camera, I won't mention it, but we all know this guy. And he visited back at our old church where we used to go. And the the guy that's preaching there to the astonishment of our friend 
actually said that if you're really born again, you should be able to levitate. I can you not. I actually checked with him. Are you sure he said that? He said, absolutely, that's what he said. You should be able to levitate. You know, you should be able to sit there and just like float up off the ground. Now, here's the thing, right? You, you might think that's a really random thing. What a random thought. What's he been smoking? But it's not that random. So you've all seen the, you've all seen the film of the Toronto thing, right? <clears throat> when Hindus watch that, they say, oh, that's Kundalini, Kundalini Yoga. I don't know if you know this, but yoga is Hindu religious practice. Do not have anything to do with yoga unless you want to become enslaved to the occult. The whole of yoga practice is designed to stir up the Kundalini <clears throat> spirit which to Hindus is like a snake that's wound around the bottom of your spine. And yoga is designed to wake that serpent up to give you supernatural powers. And for Kundalini practitioners, the ultimate achievement in their faith is, guess what? To achieve the ability to levitate. And since the spirit at work in that guy comes directly from Toronto, the Toronto blessing thing it's not an accident it's no surprise it's demonic totally demonic totally occult building on sand not checking that your theology your doctrine is actually sitting on solid rock and you, you know, we could go on and on and on, but we already went on and on for like how many years have we been doing this? So we all know what a, we all know what that is, right? But that's a current, live, and very real happening example. The one who hears my words and doesn't put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground with no foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed, and its destruction was complete. What should our attitude be towards people in such churches? Because it's easy to sit there and go, morons. You could do that, right? Or you could sit there and go, oh, well, they're getting what they deserve. So from a purely legalistic sense, that's probably true at some legal level. But what's our subject? We need to love who? Excluding who? What exclusion is in this law? No exclusion. So we have to love these people. So what should your attitude be towards others who are trapped, presently trapped in such a delusion? Who are sitting there going to church thinking the guy at the front is speaking for God and having no clue that they're being trained in the occult in the name of Jesus. What should you, what should your attitude be? Should we go the other way? What should it not be? You should not me. Give me some examples. You should not be. What? How about arrogant? You should not be scoffing. You should not think. Well, it's none of my business. Is it your business? It is. And we'll see why in a minute. So if I can't be any of those things like the world would be, what should I have then? Should I laugh or should I cry? Should I be happy for them or sad? Sad, right? So what should I feel then? We dare to go to feelings. What should my feelings toward them be? Anger? What then? Can't be happiness. I can't be happy that they're enslaved in the occult. What's left? <clears throat> Sad. How was Jesus when he came to Jerusalem for the last time? 
and he knew what was coming for that city. Remember? He says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who stone the prophets that I send you, how long have I desired to gather you under my wings, but you would not listen? Therefore, your house is left to you desolate. He knew that Jerusalem was going to be completely destroyed. Then it says what Jesus was doing while he says this. It says, Jesus wept. He didn't stand there like a, like a ha-ha, I know what's going to happen to you. He wept. That's us. To be in agreement with God about that stuff, you have to share his pain over it. You have to share his sorrow and grief over it. You have to have compassion. You have to feel sorry for them, not angry at them. Because they're victims. Remember what I said about K-pop? How evil it is. How it enslaves the fans into <coughs> idolatry. But remember what I said about the K-pop people themselves? Just because Satan is using them to enslave others, we, sh we shouldn't hate those people because they are the first victims of that lie. And for those of you who keep up with the important news, just this week, another well-known and well-loved K-pop singer they have a way of saying that they committed suicide without saying it. So it's, one, it's um, Moon Bin from Astro, found dead in his apartment. But they always say it the same way, you know it's another suicide. Do you know that Korea has the highest rate of depression in all of Asia and has the highest suicide rate in the Southern Hemisphere? You know? Mm -hmm. Worse than here. Worse than here, and here is bad. And in that industry, it's especially bad. The rate of, of depression and suicide is terrifying. So that emphasizes the point that you could be angry at them for being agents of Satan and slaving people, but they are the first victims. You know, so that's why God tells us to love our enemies. Because he understands that, yeah, they're doing evil. Satan's using them. At the right of the second, they're slaves to the enemy, agents for the enemy. But do they know that? They don't know that. And they're the first victims, and they often pay the highest price. We should be as much concern for people like that. Just using the K-pop thing, because that's an example everyone can understand, right? But, it, so it, that's an easy case to speak of, but it applies to any, anyone like that. So, to have any prayer of helping such a person, to be, have any hope of your love for them, to have God's in it to where you can be like Corey Ten Boom, where you can be bringing, you can be in a concentration camp, evangelizing and bringing people who hate God, bringing them to Christ and, and they're saved. You can have that kind of love and that kind of situation, but only if you're really his disciple. So what should we be? All our heart, all our rational mind, and action. Because as we see, Jesus draws a real distinction between those who just know but don't do and those who know and then decide to do it. So we want to be doers of what we learn in our relationship with him. Do it first to who? Yourself. Then the inner you will become more and more in agreement with God and that means the experience of your neighbour will get better and better. You know? There's a spin-off benefit as well. You won't need to wear a mask anymore. <coughs> All humans wear masks. <coughs> nobody, nobody shows you who they totally are. No one. 
but you that self-defense becomes less and less relevant the more you are comfortable just agreeing with Jesus about yourself then you don't mind just being yourself in front of other people so life becomes less stressful you're more able to just be who he's making you instead of having to have like multiple personalities if you like okay I think we're done with that page yes we have over to page three now we get into the the difficult case of people who don't like us back so Matthew 5 verse 43 if you're at home Matthew 5 verse 43 you have heard that it was said love your enemy sorry love your neighbor and hate your enemy but I tell you love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your father in heaven let's pause there why does loving your enemies make you a child of God because that was in Christ's name um, by uh, was character absolutely right it's in Christ's character but in terms of what we said tonight just wind the clock back a bit to the beginning it, just what um, Shane said but can you narrow it down to something more specific in terms of our three-step process so if you love your enemies this makes you a child of God right so I'll give you a clue this is a Hebrew thing right Jesus is the son of David right in scripture Is he? Isn't his, isn't from an earthly point of view, his father, everyone thinks, is Joseph, even though it's actually God? How does David suddenly get to be, how does Jesus suddenly get to be a son of David? It's a Hebrewism. So when you say son of, Ben, so he's Yeshua Ben David. Jesus, the son of David, it doesn't necessarily mean literally the biological child of. It means in that character of, in the reflection of. This is what's going on in this statement. When you love those who hate you, you are in the character of God who loved someone who didn't love God? Who's that? You. There was a time when you were that person that you're annoyed with. That person that you say, oh, you know, why don't they love God? What's wrong with them? Well, that used to be you. Did God postpone loving you until you change your mind? No, he loved you and then changed your mind. So that's what this statement means. When you don't delay, when you don't wait for them to change, when you love them as God does, that's, a, that's very critical, in agreement with God. So you love them the same way God does. That makes you, in his character, a child of God can only understand that from a Hebrew perspective, otherwise it makes no sense in English. <clears throat> then look what it says. You, you, you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? Some of your Bibles will just say, are not even the pagans doing that. And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. What's that about? Why is he contrasting? This is Jesus talking. Why is he contrasting loving people that don't love you back 
with loving people who do love you back, your own people. Why is he saying that just loving those who love you back isn't all that much of a thing? He goes as far as to say, even the pagans manage that. What, why is this of such concern to God? If that command wasn't there, how big do you think the church would be? It'd be tiny. Because no one would ever evangelise anyone outside of their own family. And as soon as someone didn't like them or was rude to them, they'd, you know, not talking to you anymore. You can go and die. This is what separates the real disciples, those who are really born again. If I say born again, what jumps into your mind? What, am I, what impression does, if I say, oh, I'm a born again Christian, it's like a swear word in some places now. What is born again Christian? What should I expect to see? If I'm really a born again Christian, what should you see? Well, alas, thanks to the crazy NAR types, most people assume that therefore I'm going to lay on hands and heal or maybe I'll levitate. You know? What is it? That's all nonsense, right? Born again has nothing to do with signs and wonders. Nothing. What should you see? What should you experience if I'm born again? Should you experience someone as just the same as the world? No, that, because if I'm unchanged, if I'm just the same as the world, I haven't been born again, have I? I've just continued as I was. Born again means made new and completely unlike the world. So just doing what the world can do has no special meaning, no special weight. You don't need Jesus to love your own family, do you? You know, Adolf Hitler loved his dog. You be, right? He's still a murderous scumbag. He loved his dog. You couldn't say he's a loving person because just because he loved his dog, because anyone can love a dog, right? That's what Jesus is saying. Anyone can love your own family. Anyone can love people who love you back. It doesn't distinguish anything. Every culture has this. No matter how pagan. A parent's love for their children is common to more human beings, for instance. Right? He's saying, you have to stand out. You're my disciples. You're born again. You have to be more than that. You have to be like your Father in heaven who loves sinners. Why did Jesus come into the world? What's his ministry? Starts with R. Reconciliation. Remember, reconcile means to take two things that were <laughs> apart and bring them back together. So a couple that were separated, if they get back together, you say they're reconciled. Okay? So the ministry of Jesus is to reconcile sinners to God, because sin separates you from God. So the whole point of, his, of being Christian is to assist with reconciling sinners, bad people, to perfect good God. How are you going to reach bad people if you uh, got your hand up like, not on, not on my lawn, please? You know? We have to go that extra mile. We have to love those people who we have every right to not love from a human perspective. Can anyone tell me, is most human love, as the world understands love, if you just look around everyone you know in the world, your workmates, you know, everyone you know, is the motivation of most human love and the effort people put into it, is it mostly selfless, meaning it's for the benefit of the loved, 
or is it selfish, meaning it's for the benefit of the one loving? On balance, if we put it in the scales, which way do you think it tips? Selfish. Selfish, right? And that's the reality. The problem with the fallen nature is humans can be extraordinarily zealous and creative in this enterprise called love, even coming up, now you have an app, right? You can put so much effort into loving someone that you just, I don't even know which way you swipe, you know? So this way they're in the toilet and this way they're in your phone book, right? But, but you know, that's, that's human fallen nature because it's all driven by what I want. They're not even thinking about what's good for the other person at all. Jesus laid his life down for people that hated him. Everything about, everything about agape is costly. Everything about agape is in spite of the other person. So you've got nothing to gain from them usually. <coughs> if you do gain something, it's a bonus. Agape does not self-seek. It seeks the good of the one who is loved. So when you love your enemy, you are you don't have to search around looking for what's in it for me, because the answer should be nothing. Other than one thing. That because you're a human, you need something that's for you. What's there is one thing. What is that? You when someone is saved, what does the scripture say happens in heaven? The angels rejoice. That's your reward. You want to be like the angels. You are an angel. What does angel mean? Messenger. Messenger. So if you are the witness that God uses to bring that person back to God, you are one of the angels who gets to rejoice when someone who is going to hell is instead going to heaven. Your reward is to share in your master's joy. Does that make sense? But your motivation, if it's to be pure, can't be about what you think that person has that you'd like to get. It's not in the notes, but since there's probably lots of young people listening, I always used to explain the two buckets. Have I explained the two buckets? Forgive me if, I've, if you've heard this before, but others won't. So here's a classic, a classic human-human relationship. Boy meets girl on Tinder or somewhere, wherever that happens now. Boy meets girl, boy is not feeling complete. Girl is not feeling complete either. <laughs> And she says to her girlfriend, I might go out with that guy because I think he might complete me. <laughs> you know, we'd be great together. We'd be much more complete together. All thinking about what they're missing and how this person might answer that what's missing, right? Not what I might bring to them, but, but, but that they might be the answer to what's missing, right? So now, those two people are pictured by two buckets who are half full of water. Both buckets are incomplete. They're not completely full. Both buckets are half full. And then they meet. The agenda of the first bucket is to get the water out of the second bucket to fill itself up. The other bucket's thinking the same thing. What is that marriage, God forbid it should turn into marriage, what is that relationship now? It is a pumping contest. Who can pump faster until you drain the other person to fill yourself up. The relationship becomes a competition for taking selfishly. You understand? And any giving is with a wrong motivation. Any giving is to keep the person from leaving so that you can finish pumping them dry. You think it's a joke? Hell no. Having counseled Lord knows how many couples so, so many 
relationships that I've encountered are two half full buckets having a pumping contest. <laughs> right? Christ's model is that husband should be willing to lay down his life for the woman. He should be willing to empty himself to fill the other bucket up and vice versa. Does that make sense? So they, they build each other up. They, they, they look for what's from outside to add to the relationship to build them both up. You are always concerned for the other person as Christ was concerned for sinners. What can sinners give to Jesus that he didn't already have in heaven? Nothing. Right? Does Jesus need you? No. Do you have something that he's missing? Only yourself. You know? Sin separated you from God. He wants you back. But it's not like he's a half full bucket. He's an endless spring of water able to fill all those buckets up. Anyway, that was a slight diversion, but one word taken, I think. So when you, when you look at that command in Matthew 5 and loving our enemies, you understand why I shared about Corey Ten Boom. She is a living example of someone living that out. All those people she spent her whole life evangelizing, looking after, helping, are all the people that if she was not born again, she would be plotting how to burn them alive in their houses. You know, because of what they did to her sister and so on. Now, it says there, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Didn't we just say before that one of the things I have to allow myself is patience, time? Why is this command? We have to be perfect. Anyone manage perfection? Well, I wasn't looking. Me neither. What's this? Well, thank God this is supposed to be in Greek, not English. It gets translated as perfect. It's a very imperfect translation. The word here is teleos. Teleos has a very specific meaning in Greek, and it means it's about a process. So to, to put this to express more accurately what the Greek says, it's like this. Your father is perfect. You should teleos. You should be in the process aiming for his perfection. Does that make sense? So when it says be perfect, teleos, it means you should be in a process. It doesn't mean like be bang, now I'm perfect. It doesn't mean be in a state of perfection. Teleos, process. So it's telling us again, action. Learning from him. He's the template. Jesus is the perfect role model. So the more you know Jesus, the more you know the target the goal that you're working that you're doing teleos you are in a process aiming toward that perfect mold because we have to have a compass bearing right we can't just proceed randomly we need like a vision where we're going we need a goal what we're aiming at so if, the more you know Jesus the more you know that's your your goal your goal. Just like an athlete, you know, if you're trying for a world sprinting record, you'll have a sprinter in mind that you're trying to run like and run as fast as. That's like Jesus who running ahead of us. Does that make sense? Anyway, practical things. Because we want to have some practical things. So, Ephesians 2. Because we're told to command, oh, sorry, we're commanded to love those who don't like us, even our enemies. This means, like Corey, who was able to agape those camp guards that killed her sister. Do you think that's easy? Hell no. So we need some practical tools that are to 
assist us in being able to pull this off. So we're going to look at Ephesians 2, verse 11. Therefore remember that formerly you who are Gentile by birth and called the uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, that's the Jews. Remember that at that time, so before you were Christian, at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise. Without hope, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Before you were saved, that's you. Without God in the world, without hope, without knowledge, without a role model, without that compass bearing, no ability to agape because you don't even know what agape is. So when you're looking at this horrid, horrid person who's treated you so terribly, you know, think of Corey Ten Boon watching her sister die at the hands of these guards, the very same guards that she will evangelise later. Right? How does she see them? like this. She doesn't see them as powerful. She doesn't see them as being, doing it in the full volition of truth. You know, knowingly having the whole truth and choosing to do this. She sees them as they're described here. <clears throat> without God, without hope, heading for the lake of fire in ignorance. What does Jesus pray on the cross about everyone that's crucifying him? <coughs> Father, forgive them what? If they don't know what they're doing. Because they're without God and without hope in the world. They are blind. What's one of the things Messiah comes to do? So that the blind may see that those who are living in darkness might receive the light. That's a reference to the Gentiles. Right? You also used to be like that. That's what he's saying here in Ephesians. So when someone is treating you in an absolutely ungodly pagan way, you are looking at your former self. That helps enormously in dealing with them. Because you suddenly realize that they are still what I used to be. And since I understand how easy it is to be stuck in that, and what a miracle it is that God brought me out of that and, let, and took away my blindness and allowed me to have genuine hope, a genuine future, then instead of being angry at them and thinking that they're the one with all the power and they shouldn't do this and they shouldn't do that, I can say with Jesus, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Because guess what? They don't. They think they do, but in an absolute sense, they don't. They have no concept of God or consequences or what's coming for them unless they repent. They're clueless. No idea. So instead of feeling disempowered and helpless and angry and bitter, when you get up on the cross where Jesus say, Father, forgive them, they really don't know what they're doing. And you realize you're just looking at your own self. What are you going to say? I used to be like that, but now I'm not. How can you apply that to them? They're like that now, but if God is willing to hear my prayers, they don't have to stay like that. What are you going to do then? You're going to pray for them. What are you going to do for them? You're going to show them a better way. What if they don't listen? That's their choice. What are you going to do? You're going to show them a better way. How are you going to show them a better way? Well, I'm going to love them the way God has taught me to love myself. Just one way. I'll go the extra mile. I'll turn the other cheek. All those things. Right? I'll make decisions for me that are Christ-like, regardless of what they do. 
because I want them to be saved. And how will they get to know if they never meet a real Christian? And where's the other real Christian in the room? Oh, it's me. You understand? And it's easy because that's who you're meant to be anyway. So you shouldn't be doing anything extra. You just, you're just making sure, more sure, that around that person, you make double sure that you're really walking straight in the Lord around that person. I had a new credit manager come to work and he was just a psycho. He was just, he was power crazy, right? And he just drove me insane. And I complained to my flatmate and I got a bit bitter. And God woke her up in the middle of the night and had her pray. And when I got up in the morning, she came and knocked at my door and said, God spoke to me last night about your boss and you have to pray for him now and then watch what he does. And I'm like, okay. And I'd learned a long time ago that if Barbara said that, then I should do it. So I did. I really earnestly prayed for him based on this. Right? Went to work, sat down. As soon as I sat down, he appeared in my office, smiling. I'm like, this is suspicious. Why are you smiling? And then he says, do you want to come for a ride in the car with me? I'm thinking, oh, oh. This feels like it's like a trap. But I was like, okay, I've got to go with it, right? Because God said, watch what I do. The whole day, guess what we did? This is my boss. He's in charge. He's driving us. Guess what we did? We played hooky. Do you know what that means? Probably don't. We were wagging school. He was avoiding the office. He bought me lunch. He bought me ice cream. We went off and, yeah, we basically hid from the office for the whole day. And there was no agenda. And then I realized that God was showing me, I can deal with your boss at any time. Because everything that was happening was the exact opposite of his character. And God was just showing me. Don't be afraid of him. I can turn him into this anytime. It's like this. You know? It's the weirdest thing. But I never forgot the lesson. Right? Never forgot the lesson. So never be afraid of those people. See them as they are. Remember, love has to deal with the truth. See them as Jesus saw us from the cross. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And understand that that was you before. And you're not that anymore. So it means that just like he did with my boss, he is able to make a soul into a poor. Isn't he? He was able to take old you and make you. Remember we always say it's not who you were. It's not even who you are now. It's who you are going to be in the kingdom that matters. Teleos, process, right? The problem is when we run into wicked people, we forget that, that we used to be like them. We forget that they can change. We make the mistake of thinking, that's them, that's just how they are. That's only true in the literally in the, in the here and now sense. It does, it's not true that they can't be someone else. In God's hands, they can be someone completely different. Pray for them. Be a witness to them. Tip of the wise, be a consistent witness, which means don't, you know, hand out Bible tracts in their office or start going there with the guitar and start singing hymns or whatever. They just need to see a consistent difference with you, a real, you know, consistency. And when they ask you questions, give a Christian answer. Yeah. Like I did in a meeting at police headquarters the other day. And a senior cop there, and he said something stupid. And before I could stop myself, I said to him, I said, please don't speak like that. And he goes, why? He says, because I'm concerned for your salvation. Silence. <laughs> and then one of the other guys says, right, he's a priest. And the guy went, oh. But he stopped saying that. 
right? So it's fine to be matter of fact, because you're talking about the truth. You don't have to come up with clever words. Sometimes you just tell the truth, you know? Anyway, I digress. Let's move on. So the first practical thing is, see them as they really are. Truth, truth, truth. And there, and going down a bit further, you see Romans 5, which we already did, but God demonstrates his own love for us while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So in the same way, don't delay or postpone your love until that person reaches some mystical standard where they at last deserve your love. Love them now. Love them as Christ loved you when you were still like them. Still like them. Now, we always run into this stumbling block, which is the issue of justice. Because people think that God is saying, if we to love those who are wicked, to love those who are even doing bad things to us, that you are somehow going along with their sin. That you are somehow, that I should be hotly opposing it, shaking my fist and threatening them, you know. This is a mistake. There are some commands that we can't get around. So right at the bottom of page three, we'll start to look at this issue of justice. God says in Matthew 6 and elsewhere, if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sin, your Father will not forgive your sins either. Remember, with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. I've met so many people in counselling who are stuck because they know they're supposed to forgive but they feel that if they forgive, they are somehow letting that person off, that there won't be justice. How do you think it was for Corey Ten Boom publicly forgiving those concentration camp guards that killed his sister and thousands of others? Was she throwing justice out the window? Will there be justice in the world? Do we have to take revenge for there to be justice? Is justice up to us? These are the big questions, right? God has given a command. Let's all remind ourselves, when, on what occasion are you allowed to not forgive? Never. It's a command, and it comes with a big consequence. If you refuse to forgive, neither will you be forgiven. That is so heavy, so scary, and it's meant to be scary. Meant to be. So how are we going to get around the fact, because, you know, the more righteous you are, the closer you are to Christ, justice starts to matter to you. Right and wrong, you know, becomes a burden. So if you fall into the trap of thinking that if I forgive this person, I've let them off the hook. Like, you know, they've just they've got away with it. So it's important for us to understand what God says about this. So over on page 4, Romans 12. This, you should learn this off by heart. This is so important. Remember, this is practical stuff. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. So that's, we'll just do it piece by piece. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Why? That, which we'll come to in a second, but something more practical. So if, if, uh, if Daryl had come over and hit me, He's running already. Because <laughs> it's alright, we're not doing a 3D demo, so it's okay. So if Daryl would come over and hit me and Alan's watching, and he knows Alan knows I'm a Christian, and and I walk over there and I you know and I hit him back and I promise you you don't want me to hit you back. That never ends well. <laughs> And as I'm hitting him back, I say, you're not allowed to hit me. 
that sin, as I've just hidden back, what's Alan going to think? Hypocrite. You know, you've descended to doing the thing you've just said is wrong. You're all angry about it being wrong, but you, now you've done something that's the same. Your witness is over. You know, your credibility is gone, right? Our witness is so important to God. We are not to descend to the level of our enemies. We are not. We are to reflect Christ, not the people who are hurting us. So if you descend to their level and do like an eye for an eye, or you know, like tit for tat, you're useless as a witness. Right? And anyone watching is hurt because if they know you're a Christian, now they just think that Christians are no better than pagans, right? No different. That's why we're told to turn the other cheek, walk the extra mile, to make people realise, why isn't he hitting him back? He's bigger than him, he could knock him down. Why isn't he going over there and just smacking him in the head? You want them to be puzzling that. Hopefully they'll come and ask you, why don't you just hit him back? And you get to your moment, right? It's your moment to share. But what about justice? Does that mean I just have to let people punch me? Look what it says next. Oh, sorry. Do what is right in the eyes of everyone. People read this wrong. Right? I've I listened to a sermon on this in a certain church, and it's just the worst, but he misunderstood this to mean you should do whatever everyone thinks is right. Just see what it says. Do what is right in the eyes of everyone. So he taught it as, you should do whatever everyone says is right. That's not the meaning of this. Remember, this is in Greek, right? So that means you'll do something different depending on who your audience is, that you'll, you'll compromise to fit in. So whatever they say is right, you'll do that. So you'll be like this with one group. And obviously, that's not right. What does it mean then? Very simple. Remember? With the measure you use, it'll be measured to you, so you should just have one way of rolling, one measure, Christ-likeness. That's what this means. So in front of everyone, you should always do what is right. So regardless of who's watching, do what is right, in an absolute sense. How do you define that? Whatever Jesus would do, that's the definition of what is right. What would Jesus do now? Do that. I used to teach that in Sunday school. The little kids, you know, think about Jesus. What would Jesus do? You do that. Well, it might be for Sunday school, but for adults as well. He is our role model. So don't descend to your enemy's level. Regardless of who's watching, is that do what's right. Do what God calls is right, regardless of who's watching. Then. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. If means it might not be. It's conditional. As far as it depends on you means what? It's not a trick. As far as it's up to you, live at peace with everyone. But sometimes, like Daryl's neighbour, <coughs> your influence has a limit and no matter what you do the other person will continue to do stuff that means there won't be peace you know so sometimes you end up having to live in a conflict situation but it shouldn't no part of the conflict should be driven by you as far as it's up to you do right in front of the audience. You're God's witness. You do right. But you can't control what the other guy does. So he's not calling on us to create some, you know, artificial peace no matter what. He's only saying, as far as the bit that's in your control, don't you be the reason that there's not peace. 
forgive, set the better witness, blah, blah, blah. If the other person continues to be a psycho, then there won't be peace. But that'll be on them. You know, the consequences from God will be on them, not on you, because you're obeying him and they're not. Now we're getting into the bit about justice. Look what it says next. Do not take revenge. That's obvious. But the bit that people often miss. But leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, and I will repay. That's from Deuteronomy 32. What's he saying here? If there's a conflict situation, make sure that your side of it is clean, your clean hands. And you should be a witness to that other person. You're a Christ representative to that other person. But there's free will involved. And if that other person refuses to listen, if they refuse to stop sinning, then that's, that is not your responsibility. That's what he means by leave room for God's wrath. The word wrath is terrifying. It's beyond anger. It's to do with judgment. Hell. You know? So what's, maybe we're talking about justice. What's God saying? You're not allowed to execute justice. That's for me. But don't worry, I will repay. No unforgiven sin will ever go unpunished. You get that? No unforgiven sin will go unpunished. Why is it so important to loving our neighbour for us to grasp that? Well, we'll come to it now. If you're at home, write down for yourself Numbers chapter thir uh, Numbers 13. You'll know the story when they're coming towards the promised land. They got to the border, right? What they do? They sent out spies. And when the spies came back, what did the spies say? The Hebrew spies had snuck into the land for a look around, right? They came back and gave their report. What did they say? The people that live there are giants. They are like the Nephilim, like Goliath, right? They are terrifying. And then they says, we were like grasshoppers in our own eyes. That's what the spies say. So they saw themselves as like insects compared to these people that they would have to, if they went into that land, they would be confronted by these giants. And they're terrified. Right? What did God say? Was God happy with the spies? <laughs> no. You read it for yourself. God is not happy. What had they forgotten? The giants are bigger than them. God is bigger than the giants. Who's God with? Them. What has God said? I'm giving you that land. I myself will deal with the giants. Leave room for my wrath. I'll take care of justice. So when you're dealing with the giants in your life, the bullies, you know, the psycho boss or whatever you have, don't be like those Hebrew spies. Remember, if they are not Christ-like, if they are not saved, they can be as big and scary as they like in their own minds, but they are without hope and without God in the world. They are dead men. And God is not with them. He's with you. So is it safe to proceed? Yeah. Why? Because God himself will do what he did for the Israelites. He will be your shield. He will be your fortress. And if they attack, he will attack them. He brings, remember, he's the shepherd that goes ahead of the flock. He defends the sheep from the wolf. But it's very important to learn the lesson from the Hebrew spies. 
when you're intimidated by someone who's a bully or loud or cruel or whatever, don't forget your love. Don't let them change your view of yourself because that's what happens. They become giants in your mind. You become afraid of them. You know, you start to see yourself as a grasshopper in light of them. Is that the right self-image? No. Where are you supposed to learn your self-image in that first relationship from God? You're supposed to see yourself as God sees you, not as the giants see you. And when you do it properly, then you realise that they might be bigger than you, but God, who's bigger than them, is with you. It gives you the high ground. It allows you to view them from the cross, you know. Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. You won't be afraid of them. You won't be afraid of them. And when you sit on, when you sit on God's lap and look at those giants, how big are those giants now? Do you understand? This is practical stuff. Because you will all encounter this in your life. There's no way you can go through this world without encountering those giants in your life. This is super practical stuff you need to know. Then he says, on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. What does that mean? Simple. Be Christ-like regardless. Don't let their bad behaviour change your good behaviour. Do you get that? Do what you would do for someone who was, who was kind in return and grateful. Do it anyway. Be Christ-like anyway. Be merciful anyway. Be kind anyway. Be generous anyway. Why? Because it is right. Do not let the behaviour of the other person influence your choices ever. Ever. Otherwise, you're making the mistake of the Hebrew spies. You're seeing yourself as a grasshopper just because they're bigger than you. You must remember that they are midgets compared to your God and you're sitting in God's lap. He is your defence. He is your shield. So important. This is practical, right? You, you literally have to do this exercise in your mind and remind yourself of the truth. Of the truth. And if you're wondering about, well, what is God going to do with the wicked in the end if they don't repent? You know, how, can I be sure there will be justice? Because, like I said, it's hard to let go of the sense of justice. The classic example I used to encounter all the time were people who, who experienced sexual abuse as a child, incest, things like that. It would just dominate their whole life, totally control their whole life. They would constantly see themselves as a person who's not worthy of being loved because of the way a parent treated them as a sex toy, you know? God requires them to forgive and move on because he can't have them living in idolatry of that adult. When you let the bad person sit in God's seat controlling who you are, that's idolatry. But it's so hard to let go when you feel that forgiving them is like excusing them. So if, I, if you were going to say to someone, you have to forgive, tell me what people usually mean. If someone comes and says, oh, you just have to forgive, what do they usually mean by that? So put the Bible aside for a second, just in common language. If someone says, oh, you just need to forgive, what do they usually mean? What do they want you to actually do? Forget about it. Yes, Alan's got it. What they almost always really mean is they want you to forget about it. To stop thinking about it. But if you've been 
deeply wounded. That is impossible. You can't stop thinking about it. What is God's for, what's different when God says forgive? Well, here's something that's self-evident, but people forget. You can't forgive a sin that isn't a sin. The first thing you have to do is acknowledge that it's really a sin. Remember, love deals in the truth. God does not ask you to pretend that a sin didn't happen, to just forget about it like it wasn't. That's why it keeps coming back when people try the secular way. God wants us to face it head on, beginning with the complete acknowledgement that what happened was sin, and sin brings consequences. And if that person doesn't repent, Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. God will avenge himself for the sin carried out against you. Do you understand? Now instead of feeling scared of that person, you can feel worried for them. Because you realise that anything you were thinking you could do to them, but you're going to do, go and, you know, let the air out of their tyres or set fire to their house or you know, poison their dog or whatever vengeance you think you're dreaming up. How does that compare to throwing them into the lake of fire to be tormented forever and ever? Pretty lame, right? What you were thinking. But that's what's facing them if they never repent. And God makes it so extreme so that even like Corey could go to those camp guards and appeal to them to repent and turn to Christ. Because nothing she was thinking might be revenge compares to what's actually going to happen to them. Actually. And that's so horrifying that she would rather they repented. That she would rather they turn and save themselves. Compassion. And when you can have compassion instead of bitterness, that will set you free. That will set you free of bitterness. That will set you free of whatever it is that binds you. Is this making sense? I hope so. Make sense. Malachi 4. Surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. And the day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. But for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays, and you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. Then you will trample on the wicked. They will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty. Remember one Messiah, two comings. The first time he comes as the good shepherd, the second time he comes as the avenger of blood. Justice, the line of the tribe of Judah. That's how extreme it's going to be. The more you can understand that, that that's the fate of the wicked, those who reject Christ, those who won't repent, the easier it is for you to not be afraid of them, for them to not become giants in your mind. If you realise that's what's facing them, that kind of obliteration, when God himself unleashes on them. Then you can only feel sorry for them. You'll never feel scared of them again. So I was asking God how to explain this. So this is what came into my mind. So I'll just share it. You know what a suicide vest is? Like those crazy Islamic people that run into a building and blow themselves up? So I don't know if you know, but... To make sure they don't change their mind, the guys wearing those suicide vests, whoever dresses them in it, they have padlocks on them. So once you're in it, you can't get out of it. And they're on a timer that if you don't press the button, the timer will run down to zero and it will blow up anyway and you can't get out of the vest because you don't have the keys. The ones that some whatever mad mullah or whatever that sent you off to blow yourself up for Allah, he's got the keys, right? 
So when I was praying about this, I kept having this picture of a suicide bomber. I thought, Lord, what are you showing me? I said, when someone's there being aggressive and threatening you and claiming to have, you know, be able to harm you and do all this, like, you know, and wanting you to be afraid of them and be little in front of them and everything, he says, just picture them wearing one of those vests and you're watching the timer running backwards towards zero. So that no matter what their threat is, all you can see is they're going to die. They can't get themselves out of that vest and that timer is going to run out. And when it runs out, boom. They're as good as dead already. Unless someone can get the vest off for them. You won't hear their threats, you know? You won't be intimidated by your threats. You won't see them as a giant. You'll just see them as someone who's doomed. And you're watching the time just flashing by already. Every second is one second less they've got before they're doomed. Right? Now, God forbid you should ever meet anyone with an actual suicide vest, but you get the point? <coughs> That's how we should see sinners. They are trapped like that in the power of sin. They don't have a key. They can't let themselves out. Only Jesus can free you. Right? And that timer is running out for them. And the consequences we just read in Malachi. If they're not out of if they're not if they haven't escaped before the timer runs out, it's worse than being blown up by a bomb. So when you can see your enemy like that. And hey, if it helps to imagine them wearing one of those vests, by all means, use that. <laughs> but, do you get the idea? We mustn't be like those Hebrew spies. We mustn't let the wicked seem like giants and us like grasshoppers. We have to have see them as God sees them, as dead men walking. You know? So we should be able to have compassion and be able to say, you know, if you keep this up, you're going to arrive on the wrong side of God. It gives you the power back. And it allows you to have compassion, it allows you to love someone who absolutely doesn't love you back. And remember, you're doing it for their sake, not your own. What have you got to gain from it? Nothing. Except if they repent, you'll rejoice with the angels. You're not doing it for your gain, you're doing it for theirs. Let's go over to the final page. So remember, the word here all is agape. Agape is not filio. Filio is about friendship. Agape is what you have to do. Filio is about relationship. Filio is about brotherly love and mutual love. God does not command us to filio anybody. You do not have to be their friend. Practical. You do not have to be their friend. And because only filio is to do with mutual love, you, it doesn't matter how they respond. Does that make sense? Agape is only one-sided. It's about what you do. Just what you do. So however they respond, you agape. God is not commanding you to make a new friend. God's not commanding you to gain their, you know, their love in return. He's commanding you to show his love to them. End. Because remember, as far as it's up to you, but you can't control how they respond. So always have that limitation. Understand what he is asking you to do and what he isn't. Last one, second half of page five, I'll summarise really quickly. So Ephesians 6 verse 18. <coughs> Remember last week we talked about there's just one body and you are part of it. There's one head and all the parts of the body are joined to the one rice. And we, we read earlier that we are not to love only those who love us back, to love even our enemies, but there's another group we have to think of. 
really easy to just love the members of your own family. It's pretty easy to love the members of your own church. We then think straight away about the unsaved, but there's another group that always gets forgotten. It's the rest of the body. You know, that are your brothers and sisters in Christ, but they're not your church. Let's see what God says about that. Ephesians 6 verse 18. Pray in the Holy Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. What does all mean? All. Okay. So I think I asked you guys to, as an exercise, to watch Yerim Worship's Namdi's testimony specifically because you don't know her specifically because she's, their church is not our church did you feel a connection did you have you know remember if part of the body is injured the whole body hurts this is a big deal with God you know so if it helps you mature in that thing continue to pray for her or even anybody that's not in this church, that's maybe not in this country, and even better, if you don't know them, you know, you've never met, and maybe you never will meet, probably. Develop agape for them in prayer, for your sake. Not only that God will answer your prayers for them, but the exercise of doing it, to increase your awareness that we're not it, we're just a little piece. How many Christians are there in the world? Only God knows, right? But approximately 30% of the world's population are Christian. We're the largest single group of any religion. Hotly followed by Islam, who's about 26% or something. And then all the rest of it is spread over everything else. Right? If Let's imagine that that means about three billion people go to church. And let's imagine that just a third of them are really disciples. That's still a billion people. It's, it's probably much more. But still at least a billion people are your brothers and sisters. Why is that important? When you feel like you're the last one left, just remember that. So get in the habit of praying for, what I do is I go on YouTube and I put in Christian worship, and then I'll pick a country. Japan, Korea, whatever. It's always so So I just, I just, even if I can't understand the language, I don't care. I just pray for them. Because of this, this does something for you. Seriously pray for them. Really, whatever God brings to mind, pray that and care about them. Even though you're never going to meet them, there's nothing in it for you, right? about maturing you. And remember, no matter if you feel like you're the last Christian, you're the last except for the other billion. Right? Remember that. And in Matthew 23, verse 9, do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. Remember, it's one father, one family. Don't forget, you are part of something way, 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 way bigger than your family, even as big as our family is, which only usually seems like the entire population of the earth, but, you know, we are part of an enormous family. One father, one family have the same concern for them all, for them all. 1 Corinthians 12, where we see this in the red there, it says, but God has put the body together giving greater honour to the parts that lacked it, so that sh there should be no division in the body, but its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part <coughs> suffers with it. If one part is honoured, every part rejoices with it. All the parts should have equal concern for each other. So whatever concern you have for anyone in here, because we'll use Namdi, whose testimony you watched, our concern for her, even though we don't know her, and probably never meet her, 
God instructs us to be as concerned equally for her with her, you know, cancer and stuff, as if that was one of us here. Because family, one father, one family, you know, has a remarkable effect on you, I promise. And then the very last thing, right at the bottom, 1 Timothy 2, I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession and thanksgiving be made for how many people? For all people. Our love should be for everyone. Pray for everyone. Don't have the group that you exclude. We're commanded to love our neighbour, all of them, even those who hate us back. So lots of things to put into practical. You can adopt as your practice, as your way of coping. Keep this, don't lose this. Because the worse the world gets, the more you'll need these skills to stand. Does that make sense? Okay, so we're done. And it's time to put your leotards on and your leg warmers. Oh no, wait, wrong well, decade. Okay. Sorry. So, so in case you're wondering about what this is, we're having Zumba after this. Holy Zumba. No, just kidding. Regular Zumba. So that's us for the week. And um, I hope that blessed you. Please read over it a few times until you've got these things really clear, clear, clear in your mind. Because they're things you, have, you need to be able to do to keep yourself standing. So until next week, shalom. See you then. Yeah.